I get to review an episode of Creep Show. Unfortunately, it's the weakest of the series so far. I'm Red Crank, and in this edition of the Death Curse Society Slash Report, let's talk about Creep Show Episode 3, which included the stories All Hallows Eve and The Man in the Suitcase. All Hallows Eve opens, naturally, on Halloween night. A group of friends are meeting to go trick-or-treating, or so we think, but there's more to this night activity than just treats. This group is more than friends, actually. They're all members of a club called the Golden Dragons. They have a treehouse, play Dungeons and Dragons, and have a code of honor they swear by. We also learn two in the group are brothers, the younger of which doesn't speak and wears a white sheet as an old-school ghost costume. They also mention that this is the last time they will trick-or-treat together. Hmm. Once they are all together, they visit their first house, but the man who opens the door seems startled to see the group. The group harasses the man about the slim pickings he offers them for candy, and finally leave as the man slams the door closed. One of the friends brags that they made him piss his pants, which he did not, but he was obviously scared of the group. At the next house, Mrs. Collins opens the door, and the kids just walk inside. She offers them blueberry muffins, but Binky isn't a big fan, asking what else she has available. Mr. Collins enters, angrily calling them monsters. As Binky loads up on the remaining muffins, the husband pleads with them as the group leaves, mourning the loss of their son, and asks them, when will they stop? Pete, the leader of the group, simply replies, when we're done. The kids stop by the location of their old treehouse, which is long gone, mysteriously. It seems nostalgia is sneaking up on the group, as Pete admits to his quiet little brother that he misses their parents, too. Then it's on to their last stop of the night, the Hathaway House. No one answers the door, so they break in and find Mrs. Hathaway inside holding a shotgun. She threatens to shoot them, but all they want is to find her son, Eddie. Quote, we need him to break the cycle, Pete says. Eddie finally appears in a darkened doorway and takes the rifle from his mother, pulling the trigger, but nothing happens. The group grab Eddie and drag him away. Eddie screams of his innocence as he is dragged through the town's streets. Window curtains close in nearby houses like the neighbors are used to this kind of strange activity. We next find Eddie tied to a tree, still proclaiming his innocence, while the others pile sticks at his feet. Eddie pleads with Skeeter, the youngest of the group and quiet little brother of Pete, to help him and explain his innocence to the rest of them. Skeeter just lifts his sheet to reveal the horrifying charred remains of what's left of Skeeter. We flash back to the treehouse years before, where the group is playing a game before going trick-or-treating. While they try to leave, they realize the door is stuck, and that a group of older kids, including Eddie, are below with a box of matches. They light the tree on fire, killing the Golden Dragon member. In an act of revenge, the group seems to have been reenacting over the last few years, taking one person that killed them from their own family and killing them. Pete lights a match and drops it at Eddie's feet. The episode ends on a somewhat touching moment when the group says goodbye one last time. Pete gets a kiss on the cheek from the only girl in the group and says he wish he would have known his brother longer. Pete removes Skeeter's sheet costume and his little brother appears just as he once did before the fire. The group walk into the local cemetery and disappear. This tale ends up being a twisted story of revenge from beyond the grave. Honestly, if you hadn't figured out that the kids were dead the whole time, you weren't paying attention because there were clues everywhere, from what they said to the living and references they made to each other. It was a twist that was blatantly obvious, and that is my primary complaint about this story. The kids played well off each other, reminiscent of the cast of Stranger Things, or the young cast of It, but I felt this story could have been told better somehow. The next tale, The Man in the Suitcase, starts with Justin alone in an airport waiting for a suitcase at baggage claim. After it seems like his luggage got lost and no one is around to assist him, a lone suitcase shoots out of the turnstile and he takes it away. He smokes a joint and drives home when he accidentally FaceTimes his girlfriend, Carla, who just broke up with him. They argue briefly, which gives us a look into his personal life. When he gets home, he just plunks the suitcase down, looks for some food, and gets high again, confirming Carla's claims about his unmotivated lifestyle. Later, the suitcase moves on its own, and Justin finally opens it to discover, wait for it, the man in the suitcase. I hate it when titles are completely obvious. This is the best part of the entire episode, the simple effect of a man twisted and stuffed into a small suitcase but this is where the episode takes a strange turn. The man asks for Justin's help getting out, and when he does, a gold coin spurts from his mouth. The man explains that he produces gold when he feels pain. 
I think you can probably see where this story is going from here. Justin takes the coin to a pawnbroker and discovers its authenticity and isn't quite sure what to do about the man in the suitcase. It literally bothers me every time I have to say it. When Justin and his roommate, Alex, arrive home, they discover Carla leaving, frightened. After a somewhat funny moment, they discover, you know, the man in that, yeah. Alex and Carla convince Justin to crank as much gold out of this guy as possible. They agree to only torture the man for 48 hours, which makes sense, right? Yeah. Of course, after 48 hours, the amount of gold they've attained doesn't quite fill the needs of Carla and Alex, who, by the way, are fucking behind Justin's back. When Justin finally says he's done torturing the stranger, yeah, that's what I'll call him, the stranger. Carla turns on him, striking him in the head with a large wrench and causing him to fall down the stairs. Alex and Carla plan to take the money and run, but decide to kill the stranger and get as much gold out of him as possible before they leave. In a nice, cheesy special effect, the stranger, oh, that feels so much better. He turns into a sort of evil genie type thing. The episode ends as the stranger boards an airplane, checking two bags which seem to contain Carla and Alex. So this tale stresses the importance of doing the right thing and accepting the consequences of your actions, which is a common theme of horror. But again, I thought the execution could have been better. Both these episodes are fine, but they didn't blow me away. So far, I think my favorite story has been The House of the Head, primarily based on the solid performance of Kaylee Fleming. But we're halfway through what Creepshow has to offer us this year, so I hope a majority of the next three episodes are home runs, or this might turn into a disappointment for me. Overall, I'm still enjoying the series, but not as much as I wanted to, and this episode left a lot to be desired. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below, and catch up with all the latest horror news in our new full episode on YouTube. Until next time, don't forget to subscribe, DCS out, and I'll see you soon. Woo!